Donna, 1982. Donna was the possible name of a young woman who died after sustaining injuries after she was hit by a tractor trailer in 1982. She may have used the name Donna while traveling, but it's unknown if this was her real name. What they do know is that a Louisiana police officer believes he spoke to her and that she had given him the name of Donna. He stated that she told him she was a runaway and had a friend or a sister in Las Vegas, Nevada. He also said that she spoke in a very thick Cajun or Southern accent. The victim died after an accident happened while she was walking in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's believed she was also seen in the coastal region of Florida in the last three days before she died. Business cards were found with the victim and they came from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Canantillo, Texas, and Monroe, Louisiana. There's a post-mortem photograph in this case if anyone needs to view it for identification reasons. I don't show them on this channel, but this is one I wouldn't show anyway. It's not very clear and it's likely not to be a very good help. I will say though that her hair, despite its messy, flat state, appears to be curly, which explains the curly hair depictions in the earlier recreations. I'm younger than her, but I remember 1982 and we all had perms at the time. Even in grade school, we were getting perms, so it's possible her hair was naturally straight. If she was, in fact, 12 to 25 as estimated, her date of birth would be 1957 to 1970. She was around 5 foot 2 and 110 pounds. Donna has gone unidentified for 39 years. Unidentified John Doe, known as L. Mariachi. This John Doe, known mostly as L. Mariachi, was one of the names used by a man slain during an argument on New Year's Day in 2008. While the person who took his life was immediately solved, his identity was never resolved and it's not an easy one. This is one of the rare ones where you have actual pictures and yet he's still unidentified. He was likely 20 to 35, which would mean his birth date was 1973 to 1988. In this case, he was a talented mariachi singer and he'd been living and performing in Lynchburg, Virginia. His singing was described as echoing a famous singer named Vincente Fernandez. And because he was so talented, he had begun getting noticed by locals. It's described that that talent meant many people were drawn to him and they wanted to be his friend. He was also known to perform at his friend's homes, which was a huge draw. His star was only beginning to shine though and he had trouble getting by. He was staying at a residence in Lynchburg and he was working odd jobs in the city when not performing. He was known to be a frequent visitor at Mario's Pizza on Bedford Avenue. On New Year's Eve 2007, the man known as El Mariachi, he was attending a New Year's Eve party at a 29-year-old Adolfo Valentin Morales' home. Nearly immediately after this photo was taken, the two men got into an argument, along with one of Morales' friends. It's alleged that El Mariachi somehow cut him or possibly cut one of the three men that were with him. Though it's not clear where on their bodies or how badly. It was clear that Morales was really angry. He rushed inside and he grabbed a kitchen knife, stabbing him and killing him instantly. It wouldn't be for several hours that anyone else at the party realized what had even happened, and the body of El Mariachi wasn't found until later. Morales was charged with El Mariachi's murder, but he managed to get a plea down to involuntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. It's likely that he was released in September of 2016, and it's unclear where he is today. It's possible that El Mariachi wasn't a legal resident of the United States. In fact, it's probably probable. He was found to have multiple aliases and all kinds of conflicting forms of identification. It doesn't appear he was pulling scams or doing anything illegal. So that is the most logical explanation for the random identifications. We know that he used the aliases Pedro Cruz Lopez 
and Versailles Lopez Arellano. It's believed he may have been a 28-year-old man from Pueblo, Mexico. A clue was called in to say that he had a cousin living in Washington State whose family was involved in the iron ore drilling business. If you have any information at all on El Mariachi, please contact the number given. El Mariachi has gone unidentified for 14 years. The Plaquemines Parish John Doe This John Doe was a teenager who took his own life by hanging himself from a persimmon tree in Naomi, Louisiana, which is near Belchass, Louisiana. This happened on February 14, 1975. But he did what he could to leave behind a note, addressing it to his parents and even sealing it inside of a glass jar so that it wouldn't become damaged. He rested the jar against a tree trunk. That maybe makes it all a little bit sadder, because he clearly meant for his parents to know what happened. But it appears he didn't give his name or theirs, and he was never identified. While the contents of the note have not been publicized, it's pretty clear it didn't lead to his name or his identity. It seems a bit mind-boggling, given he was in hiding. Yet, despite his actions to try to give his parents some kind of answer or closure, they got none. There's no information about how long he was there. The young man was 16 or 17, which, assuming he was found pretty quickly, his date of birth would be around 1958 or 1959. He was 6 feet tall and around 160 pounds. Anyone who might know him needs to call the East Baton Rouge Parish at the number shown. The Plaquemines John Doe has gone unidentified for 47 years. The Boulder John Doe, October of 1993. The Boulder, Colorado John Doe was a man found at the base of a rock formation in Chattaquia Park in Boulder, Colorado in October of 1993. He was a black man around 5'7", and he wore his black hair in a short, flat-top style. He had a receding hairline and a light beard, as well as mustache stubble. He had a scar that went through his left eyebrow. His jacket was a size medium, which was a white nylon windbreaker with blue trim, along with a digital Casio watch. A gym bag with articles of clothing and personal hygiene items was found nearby. He was likely 25 to 40 years of age meaning his date of birth was around 1953 to 1968. When I originally wrote this up and did research, he had a postmortem, but his name as site is blank now, but still in existence. They pull a page when identification is made, which makes me think this one is nearing completion and has possibly been matched. The police believe he was a local transient and it's possible he succumbed to the elements. The Boulder John Doe has gone unidentified for 28 years. Aklutna Annie. Aklutna Annie was the nickname given to a young woman whose skeletal remains were discovered near Aklutna, Alaska, 41 years ago on July 17, 1980. Her bones were found buried alongside a power line near the grave of another victim who is now identified. An Alaskan serial named Robert Hansen, who was known as the Baker Butcher, admitted to taking her life after she made attempts to escape his vehicle. He owned a bakery, which was also conveniently located in his hunting grounds. Annie is his last unidentified victim. Hansen told authorities she was either a topless dancer or a prostitute. While he claims she came from Kodiak, Alaska, others have reasons to believe she may have been from California. This case caused my daughter and I to look a little closer at the depictions that you find of these victims, and not very often do they depict the hairstyles of that time. My daughter's always teasing me about the 80s hair she sees in pictures, and one of Annie's actually does look like the kind of pictures I have from myself and my friends at that time. I don't know if I can remember any of my friends not having a perm. And we have a lot of does from 80s. I was going to use stock footage to point out the 80s and 90s hairstyles that were normal for the time, but my daughter dared me instead of putting other people on blast to use my own pictures from that time. So here's the one time you get to see what I look like. 
Now I'm as mortified by my 80s style as my children are. As tongue-in-cheek as this is, it does bring up a real issue, just how different some of the photos probably are, simply because of the styles of that time. And we have a lot of does from the 80s and early 90s that haven't been identified yet. It actually wouldn't be a bad idea to go back and remake images with the correct hairstyles. If someone didn't know me back then, they probably wouldn't ever guess I look like this, so I suspect the same could be said the other way around. I have super fine straight hair. In fact, it's so fine that my ponytail is the size of a quarter, yet back in the 80s, my hair was so damaged and so big I couldn't shove it into a banana clip. It's a very tangible difference in between then and now, or then and what would have been for them. It was normal to spend time making it as big as possible. So I also decided to flash what I look like now to make the point. All of this says it shows how different people look in these identifications. And a concerning factor is that so much hinges on people looking at these and figuring out who the people were. It does seem strange that they don't offer slight variations in these pictures. That's my rant anyway. I believe they need to do better with their recreations to meet the styles of the times. As for the butcher baker, his last unidentified victim was identified as Robin Pelkey. The reason he was called the butcher baker is he was a well-known baker. He wasn't even someone they would have expected. He was considered shy and well-liked. He was a father, a husband, and a monster. He started in 1971 and got away with it until 1983. Even then, it was a close call, and he almost got away with it. There are 17 known victims, and the monster was known for transporting them in a private plane to various areas where he disposed of them. The monster nearly got away. The last victim escaped, and she knew her captor. But it turns out the police were all too willing to believe the local business owner over a young, at-risk prostitute who even pointed Hansen's plane out to the police. Even after she described the inside of his car, the inside of his home, and they found his shoes that were left behind. The police still chose to believe it was consensual, and she was trying to shake him down for money. After all, he was a pillar of the community, and he even had an alibi. Turns out it was an alibi he talked his friend into giving him, so it was easier to believe the teenage girl was just trying to blackmail him. Even though the handcuffs he put on her when he had her were still intact when the police found her. Thankfully, however, one detective pushed back against this scenario or there probably would have been way more victims. That officer happened to be assigned to the case where other victims of his had been found. He was the one convinced the culprit was a serial, and he put two and two together, realizing that Hansen was his man. A warrant was finally issued, and it turned out that the monster was also an incredibly stupid man who kept souvenirs. It's chilling to realize how many victims there could have been, had this gone just a little bit differently. Hansen, in the end, got the one thing he didn't allow his victims, the ability to grow old and die of natural causes, something he was able to do. This is the last piece of a very sad story, and hopefully Annie's family will someday know what happened to her. She had auburn brown or reddish hair and wore handmade copper jewelry. She also owned a Timex watch. She was likely of European ancestry but may have had some Native American blood. The jewelry may be one of the biggest clues that can be seen here. She also had a white shell ring with a brown inset. Family members would be looking for someone who went missing likely as a teen and was born around 1955 to 1964 and was perhaps from Alaska or California and she was maybe 5 foot 1. Though sometimes these estimates are off, so always take them with a grain of salt. If you have any idea who she might be, Please call the number on your screen. Glutena Annie has gone unidentified for 41 years. One-Eyed Jack One-Eyed Jack was a man who was blind in one eye and was last seen hitchhiking in September 1978 near Boise, Idaho. The man who picked him up drove him to Talk, Alaska, where he stabbed the man to death. He took Jack and dumped him in the woods off the highway. Jack's identity, however, is unknown. The killer offered some information, but he didn't know much. He said his name was either John or Jack, and that he had told him he was 32 years old. He mentioned having an Oregon's driver's license and claimed to have lost his eye in a logging accident. Later working at jobs washing cars in Colorado or Utah. 
Despite the fact this is so specific, they were unable to identify him. However, the man who was responsible for taking his life also mentioned that part of why he killed him is that he was so annoying and that he lied quite a bit. When asked why he killed the man, the suspect simply stated, he was getting on my nerves. One-Eyed Jack has gone unidentified for 42 years. If the age given was correct, we are looking for someone who was born around 1947. The Barstow Jane Doe On February 9, 2010, a man was walking along Linwood Road south of Barstow, looking for cans. Instead, he found a backpack. He decided to open it up, and inside was the head of a female wrapped in bags from Walgreens and Fiesta Foods. Unfortunately, there were no fingerprints on the sacks, or at least none that were usable. They were unable to identify her cause of death, most likely because only one body part has been found so far. The very way she was found, however, led to a determination of foul play. The perpetrator also did post-mortem damage to her face in hopes of blocking identification. Thankfully, that doesn't rule out possible recreations and especially DNA. In September of 2021, it was announced the San Bernardino County Coroner's Office had been working with Barbara Ray Venter in order to identify the decedent known as the Barstow Jane Doe. DNA testing has confirmed that she has Hispanic ancestry and distant relatives in Mexico. She was believed to be about 19 at the time, or perhaps could have been a little younger. This would place her birth date around 1991 to 1996. Someday this will hopefully lead to her identification. Police did state that the recreations may be further off than usual because of the damage that was done. It will likely fall to DNA to make a solid determination as to who she was. In September of 2021, it was announced that her DNA was being processed. So far, all we know is she is Hispanic and has distant relatives in Mexico. The person who did this to her also remains free. One can only hope there was DNA that will also lead to him. Her dental records were taken and can be used to confirm or rule out any possible matches. They do show that she received good dental care. The Barstow Jane Doe has gone unidentified for 11 years. The Pinellas County John Doe, also known as Ronald. Some information is known about the John Doe referred to as Ronald. He had been staying in room 15 of the Siesta Motel in St. Petersburg, Florida with a friend. He was somewhat acquainted with the hotel manager and her husband. It appears this is the reason they were not officially registered in the hotel, so the hotel had no contact information. They had paid for the room through April 27, 1980. They wouldn't live that long, however, and on April 26, around 11 p.m., the hotel manager heard arguing and went to check it out. At this time, he noticed a man getting into a Ford LTD and speeding off. She checked the room where the argument had been taking place and found Ronald and another man. Both of the men in the hotel room had been shot in the face at close range. Neither had any identification in the room. Weirdly, the two were wearing identical clothing and they're not sure why. The perpetrator's getaway vehicle was quickly found in downtown Tampa, but by then it had been abandoned. The owner of the vehicle was a 39-year-old woman whose name was David Thomas. It's discovered that her boyfriend, Kyle Watson, who went by the name Cowboy, knew both victims. Arrest warrants for the couple were quickly produced. Watson was never questioned, however. He was instead discovered deceased in a parking lot in Knoxville, Tennessee, on July 27, 1980, himself a victim of a shooting almost exactly three months after Ronald and his partner. The police have a theory that the girlfriend is also responsible for suggesting Watson was the person who directly committed the act itself while she drove the getaway car. Information suggests that the police believe there are more people involved but have declined to give any further information. One of the two men in room 215 was identified quickly as a man named Jack Roy Davis. This did not, however, lead to the roommate's name. The remaining man is believed to be from California, Tennessee, or Missouri. The other man's family refused to cooperate or help with identifying Ronald. He was around 5 foot 8 and 25 to 40 years old. He had red hair and hazel eyes. If the age estimates are true, that would mean his family members would be looking for someone with a birth date around 1940 to 1955. The man wore a beard and mustache, and he had a transverse scar 
about 16 inches long from the right side of his chest to the left side, along with suture marks. He had scars under both his right and left nipples. If you know who Ronald may be, please call the number on the screen. Ronald has gone unidentified for 41 years. Summerton Man We have a number of Australian viewers, and the plan is to include more Australian cases if I can. This is possibly the most famous John Doe from Down Under. The Summerton Man died alone on Summerton Park Beach in Adelaide, South Australia in 1948. But who he was has always remained a mystery. Even though it's been more than 70 years, people haven't stopped trying to solve this case. He was found looking dapper in a brown suit with a half-smoked cigarette resting on his collar. When he was last exhumed in hopes of identifying him, the police made the statement, it's important for everybody to remember the Summerton man is not just a curiosity or a mystery to be solved. It might be somebody's father, son, perhaps grandfather, uncle, or brother. And that's why we're doing this, to try to identify him. Police are hoping that DNA will solve this in the end. Summerton Man was found on his back in the sand, shoulders propped up against the seawall. That he was dressed so well in a suit and newly polished shoes was just more of a mystery. Two apprentice jockeys were in the area and they saw him lying there the night before. But when they went to investigate, they said his arm moved, so they moved on thinking he was fine. It was odd in part two, because if he chose to go somewhere to die, it was a weird place to do it. It was pretty public and had people often milling around the area. The examination of his remains raised more questions than it answered. All of the labels on his clothing had been removed and he wasn't carrying any ID. They couldn't identify the cause of death, but it was considered to be unnatural. There's a theory he consumed some sort of rare poison that was able to disappear without a trace, leading to heart failure. He's described as being a well-built man, 40 to 50, 5 foot 11, with gray blue eyes and brown hair that had begun to gray at the sides. Even his toenails were well-groomed. He was clearly not a homeless man, and for this reason, police believed someone would miss him and he'd be identified, but that just didn't happen. One weird aspect they found, however, is that his feet were pointed as if he had been in the habit of wearing high-heeled, pointed shoes. His calves were muscled also in a way that supports that theory. There were also suggestions that he could be a dancer. Others insisted he was a sailor or a spy. Some believed him to possibly be British. His clothes appeared to have come from America, so it's possible he was well-traveled. Many people over the years have called in tips, but all have led to dead ends. He had purchased a train ticket to Henley Beach, near Somerton Beach, but he didn't use it for some reason. Instead, he made his way to the beach by bus. They know his suitcase was found at the train station, and it contained some distinctive orange thread that had been used to repair the suit panels he was wearing so they're positive it's his case. Nothing in the bag pointed to his name. One strange clue was in a hidden pocket inside of his suit, and inside was a rolled up paper with the words, to mom shoot, which means the end or finished in Persian. It had been ripped from a book and it was about a poem, about how we are on the earth to enjoy it. And when we are done, it's time to pass on with no regrets. The book it came from was discarded in a random car and was turned in by the man who found it. The book was seen as the best clue, and inside it was a phone number for a woman who lived nearby. When the police found her and questioned her, they described her as acting suspiciously. She reacted to the photo of the Somerton man, but she claimed not to know him. The police, for years, attempted to question her, but she always refused. Eventually, an armchair detective uncovered her name but by then Jessica Ellen Thompson had passed away in 2007, never disclosing the identity of the man or how she knew him. His post-mortem photos can be found online if searched. We don't show those on this channel, but I always tell you if they're there. It does appear they are trying to use DNA to find out who he was. He was exhumed on May 19, 2021. The Severton man was likely born in the late 1800s and has gone unidentified for 73 years.
the Ala Moana Park Jane Doe, also known as Awe. This Jane Doe was suffering from severe schizophrenia and was unable to say her name. She went by Awe, which spelled in her case is A-H. She was homeless in Ala Moana Park and was eventually taken to a state hospital in Lihui in 2004. As she was too weak to walk, she would end up being cared for through the hospital until she passed away from natural causes on April 27, 2013. They had some information on her. She'd likely been living in Hawaii since 1994. She had no teeth and she was a smoker. She enjoyed reading and she had a Canadian accent. She was around 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7, tall and thin, around 112 pounds. They believe she was 55 to 65 when she was found, which would mean her family was looking for someone likely born in the vicinity of 1939 to 1949. Awe has gone unidentified for 17 years. The Pinellas John Doe, October 10, 1980. Early in October, a young man's body was found in Tampa Bay near the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Pinellas County, Florida. He appeared to be in his mid-teens to mid-twenties and around 5'5". He likely weighed around 125 pounds and had curly hair that was light brown in color. He had some facial stubble, perhaps a day or two's growth. Little else is known other than he wore a size 30 underwear. If the estimate regarding his age is correct, he was born around 1955 to 1965. The Pinellas County John Doe has gone unidentified for 41 years. The Seat Pleasant John Doe, 2007. A young man was found just hours after he passed away in January of 2007 in Seat Pleasant, Maryland. There was extensive trauma to his upper torso and there were no clues as to who took his life. He had no identification, but they believed he was around 18 to his late 20s. He was determined to be of African American descent, around 5 foot 8 to 5 10, and he weighed around 160 pounds. He had patchy razor stubble on his face, so he may have been on the younger end of that. One strange element in this case is that John Doe was wearing a lot of clothing when he was found. He was wearing three shirts, thermal black shirt, a black and gray long sleeve shirt, and he had on two sets of jeans, a stocking hat, and a black scarf. It's likely he was homeless at the time. The temperature at the time he was found was in the 30s and 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly 0 to 4 degrees Celsius so it was pretty chilly out. He had some healed scars on his knees and right of his abdomen and one pierced ear. The Seat Pleasant John Doe has gone unidentified for 14 years. His date of birth is likely around 1980 to 1990. The Two Dorchester John Does, 1988. This is a sad first for this channel anyway, Two men who died together and are still both unidentified. Hopefully finding the identity of one will lead to the identity of the other. On October 6, 1988, the body of two young men were found in a wooded area off 29 Eldon Street in Dorchester, Massachusetts. The bodies, which were already beginning to decompose, were stacked on top of each other and covered with a tarp, like abandoned garbage. There wasn't a lot to be found. Insect activity further complicated the examination. The cause of death was obvious, they had been shot execution style, and while they could tell how, there wasn't much to tell who, either who they were in life or who took that life. John Doe No. 1, whose first name may be Clayton, is described as being an African American male between the ages of 14 and 16 years old. He stood about 5 foot 4 and weighed approximately 128 to 132 pounds. His black hair was worn short and cropped. He had brown eyes. John Doe number two, whose first name is believed to be Hooker. He was described as being an African American male between the ages of 15 and 20 years old. He stood 5 foot 10 and weighed around 160 pounds. 
His hair was black with one half inch long curls, and his eyes were brown. I could not find any clues to why there was an artist's recreation done for one boy but not the other, but that is the case. A Reebok bag was found near their bodies and it included a foam cylinder with two holes and gunpowder residue, indicating this had been used as a suppressor. The police believed the pair had been from the Bronx, New York, and that they may be of Jamaican descent. There's no clear indication of why they think their names might be Clayton and Hooker, or how concrete that is as a fact. It's believed the boys may have been involved in drugs and it was a related hit. No matter what led to their deaths, they were kids and they deserve their name back. If you have any information in this case at all, please call the number on your screen. John Doe number one, Clayton, would have been born between 1972 and 1974 if their dates are correct. John Doe number two, Hooker, would have been born between 1968 and 1973. They have gone unidentified for 35 years. The Ramsey County Jane Doe, 1977. The Ramsey County Jane Doe was discovered on July 20, 1977 in St. Paul, Minnesota. She was found somewhere between Childs Road and Warner Road in St. Paul. Although it could not be determined how long she had been deceased and in the water, investigators estimated she had probably died sometime earlier that year. Forensic investigators determined that the woman was white, 16 to 30, and about 5 foot 8. She weighed about 130 pounds. She had medium length brown hair, brown or green eyes. The woman was wearing a shirt with a green, red, and blue vertical stripes, high-waisted jeans, stockings, and size eight to nine shoes. Her manner of death was not disclosed. She was most likely between 16 and 30 when she died. They also noted that she had stretch marks, which means she may have given birth at some point. She had quite a few fillings of both silver and gold in color, but also a number of chipped teeth. Currently, the DNA Doe Project is working on her DNA. If people are interested in donating to her case, please visit their website. If the age estimate is correct, she was born between 1947 and 1961. She has gone unidentified for 46 years. The Conroe Lake John Doe On August 3, 1986, at approximately 5 p.m., several people were at Crater Lake in Conroe, Texas, they were reminiscing about their old hangout when they spotted what happened to be a body in the water. Sheriff's deputies and the fire department quickly responded to what they believed was an accidental drowning. That was not the case. Instead, the man had been weighed down with two cement cinder blocks that were attached to the body via an electrical cord. An autopsy would go on to reveal that he died from multiple gunshot wounds. Authorities held out hope that his tattoos might help someone recognize him, but so far that hasn't been the case. He had a small devil and a painted tail on his lower left arm. On his upper left arm was a poor quality tattoo that said Liz. His right upper arm had a tattoo of non-professional quality also that said Baby Dawn. His left earlobe was pierced. Authorities received a tip that he went by the name of New York Billy, and it's thought that he was about 20 to 30 years old at the time of his death. Around 130 pounds and perhaps 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 6 inches tall, his hair was reddish in color and he had poor dental health. There was no forensic depiction offered before 2015 and they exhumed his body to see what he may have looked like in life. If the age estimate is correct, he was born between the years of 1956 and 1966. He has gone unidentified for 35 years. If you have any information, please call the number on your screen. The Miami-Dade County Jane Doe, 1996. This young woman was around 25 to 35 when she was found discarded in a cardboard box after being strangled to death and found around Miami Lakes, Florida in October of 1996. Very little has been released about her, unfortunately. It appears she was somewhere between 5 foot 5 and 5 foot 4 inches tall. She's likely white or Hispanic. If her estimated age is correct, she was born between the years 1961 and 1971. She has gone unidentified for 25 years. If you know anything at all about this case, please call the number on your screen. Miami-Dade County Jane Doe, 1990. Like so many of these women, the victim was found discarded on the side of the road by a passing motorist in February of 1990 in or around Miami-Dade County, Florida. She wasn't very tall. She was maybe 5 feet or perhaps even 4 foot 11 inches tall, and she weighed around 170 pounds. She had brown hair and brown eyes. 
She was wearing a plain white ring on her left finger, and although it doesn't specifically mention the ring finger, it seems to be implied, so this is perhaps a wedding ring. There is scarce information about this woman, including how she died. While there's no mention of ethnicity, it looks like she could be Hispanic or Latino. She was believed to be between 30 and 55 years of age when she passed away. I always wonder, too, about how many of these Jane and John Doe's are perhaps not permanent citizens, not their immigration status, but rather just whether or not they were traveling or visiting here and their family isn't sure where to check for them. Little Miss Lake Panasovki, for instance, is a good example. She had isotope testing and it showed she was from Europe. It's heartbreaking to think that somebody might not know where at all to even look for their loved one. When this Jane Doe passed away, she was wearing a light pink shirt with flowers and a skirt. She had on slip-on sneakers that were dark and had white rubber soles. If the age estimates are correct, her date of birth would be somewhere between the years of 1935 and 1960. She has gone unidentified for 31 years. Her contact information can be found on the screen. The Compton Jane Doe, 1975, also known as Jane Doe No. 51. On September 13, 1975, a passing motorist in Compton, Los Angeles County, California, noticed the unclothed body of a young black woman off to the side of the road. Immediately, he drove to a nearby business and notified the security guard, who contacted the authorities. Sadly, she had been shot twice in the head, and it didn't kill her. She was still alive, but was dying from blunt force trauma when they threw her from a moving vehicle. This also resulted in some injury to her face that may have made it difficult to identify her later. The site she was dumped at was near a highway, so it's possible she was a hitchhiker and from farther away. Her talk screen was clean, and because she was found completely nude, it's thought that perhaps it was an attempted assault that went wrong. Jane Doe was an African-American woman between the ages of 14 and 17. She was small, perhaps 4 foot 11 to 5 foot 2 and 90 to 100 pounds. Her black hair was short and curly and she had brown eyes. She also had a 1 to 1 and a half inch scar on the instep of her left foot. She had quite a few items of jewelry on her body and a few are shown here. A silver and white metal ring with a white stone and six green stones, a gold bracelet, a gold ring, and a large black stone that featured a gold colored flower in the middle, a silver or white metal keychain, and a white metal or silver bracelet. If you have any idea who she may have been, please call the number on your screen. She has gone unidentified for 46 years. If her age was calculated correctly, she was born between 1958 to 1961. The Finley Creek Jane Doe. The Finley Creek Jane Doe was a young woman between the ages of 14 and 25. She was around 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 3 inches tall. She had been buried in a shallow grave that was discovered by two hunters in August of 1978 at the Finley Creek Cow Camp. She had been there long enough for her to become skeletal. It appears that she had been buried face down and her skull and bones had been disturbed by animals. Investigators with the Oregon State Police arrived at the scene to survey the area. They came to the conclusion that she died somewhere before 1975 or 1976. They believe it was animal activity that disturbed her gravesite. As a result, many of the bones received some damage. A lead came in suggesting that Jane could be a pregnant woman by the name of Tina Bradford that had been seen in the area around 1977. At the time, she had been in the late stages of pregnancy, and she was in the company of a man named Paul Womack. The two's relationship was not established. However, it was stated that she was from McMinnville, Oregon. A follow-up was requested by the DA, but nothing ever came from the lead. Several renderings were done from her skull in 2020. Because her date of death is hard to determine, she was born somewhere between 1940s and 1950s, most likely. She has gone unidentified for 43 years. If you have any information at all on her case, please call the number on your screen. The Rancho Cucamonga Jane Doe On June 7, 1979, a nude body of an unidentified female was found face down on the edge of a grape vineyard near the intersection of A Street and Rochester Street in Rancho Cucamonga, California, which is in San Bernardino County. The autopsy determined she had died about 24 hours before and was strangled to death, as well as suffering stab wounds and blunt force trauma. 
She was believed to be somewhere between 15 and 30 years old, about 5 foot 2 and 100 pounds. She had shoulder length light brown hair, brown eyes, and was found wearing lower quarter earth shoes. She had good dental health and a slight overlap in her bite. There are post-mortem photos available online if you would like to look. I do not show those on this channel. She would have been born between 1949 and 1964. She has gone unidentified for 49 years. If you have any information at all, please call the number on your screen. The Macon County John Doe, 1977. Macon County John Doe was a young man who was found sitting under a tree. He was about 103 feet from Highway 185 on Wire Road in Tuskegee, Alabama. There's no signs that he was in distress. He was estimated to only be between 20 and 25 years old though. Maybe six feet tall, 135 to 155 pounds. His hair was dark brown. Authorities came to the conclusion that he was waiting for someone to pick him up. That he perhaps suffered a heart attack or a fatal snake bite. It does seem like a convenient element of the case to simply dismiss it as an accident. While it's not impossible, someone that age having a heart attack is extremely unlikely. Also, if he was waiting for someone, why did that person not report him as having passed away when they went to pick him up? That said, his remains were skeletal by the time they were found, so there's no concrete way to know what his cause of death was. He had dark hair that was 3-4 to four inches in length. He had a partial upper denture for his upper right lateral incisor. His clothing was faded glory. His shoes were around a size 9, and they had visible paint splatters. It's believed he had been sitting at that location for about 16 months. If you have any information at all on this case, please call the number on your screen. He would have been born between 1952 and 1957. He's gone unidentified for 44 years. The Brunswick County John Doe, 1977. The Brunswick County John Doe was a male found in the Brunswick River in 1977. His remains were tied inside of a burlap sack. It's impossible to tell where he went in the river, but it's believed he may have drifted from areas such as Elizabethtown or Fayetteville. He may have originally been dumped into the Cape Fear River. Very little is known about who he was, but we know he had black hair and a mild form of scoliosis. He had extensive dental work done from multiple dentists. All but seven teeth had significant work done, including a stainless steel crown. He had no dental problems or signs of decay at the time of his death. A wildlife officer found the burlap sack with his body after he'd been wrapped and snagged in the banks of the Brunswick River in Brunswick County, North Carolina. From the looks of it, his body most likely hadn't traveled too far. Along with being wrapped in burlap, there was also a burlap strap. It was tied in a simple loop around his right wrist and another in a double loop around his neck. It was determined that he had died weeks prior. Unfortunately, due to decompensation, the cause of death was hard to determine. They eventually ruled it was a homicide by drowning. This conclusion was drawn because his hands were sticking outside of the burlap sack when it was found. It appears he had unsuccessfully tried to escape before he drowned. Our John Doe was an African American believed to have been between 18 and 30 years of age. He stood at 5 foot 9 and weighed approximately 112 pounds. His hair was black and they believe his eyes were likely brown. Unfortunately, investigators looking into the case do not have access to John Doe's DNA. Upon the initial autopsy being completed, his remains were unfortunately cremated, and he received a burial at sea. His fingerprints and dental information, however, are available for comparison. If you have any information at all in this case, please call the number on your screen. Jennifer Fairgate, also known as the Fairgate Doe. I usually only cover U.S. cases, but this one is bizarre and the woman may actually have been from the U.S. I think it's unlikely, but she spoke German and English without an accent, and she booked her room in English. In June of 1995, she checked into a luxury hotel in Oslo, Norway. She used a fake ID, and it brings everything about her into question. Just one of many strange things, though. She spoke English when she booked the room, but when she arrived, she only spoke German. She was around 5 foot 2, she weighed 147 pounds. While she checked into the hotel, she would never check out again. She died of a gunshot wound, and the whole situation is sketchy, although it was ruled a suicide right away. In fact, it would take 25 years before the police would begin to question whether or not it was self-inflicted. 
The woman checked in around 11 p.m. on May 31, 1995. She booked the room for three nights, giving her name as Jennifer Fergate, born August 23, 1973, and stating she was from Belgium. Her ID would turn out to be completely bogus. She would also check somebody named Lois Fergate into the room with her, but no other woman was seen. However, a different guest said that they saw her with a man, aged 25 to 40, but he's never been identified. She disappeared for two days, but paid for the room for three. Her room key card wasn't used at all on those two days. No one saw her leave or come in except for once. The cleaning staff didn't find any evidence that she had been there, but they noted a pair of vivid high heel shoes that were a designer brand and worth quite a bit of money. They were in her room and it was notable enough to notice. The strange thing was when she passed away, those shoes were gone. Housekeeping would later notice that these were the only things that were missing. Everything else was still in the room. While in her room, she only made two phone calls. They were both to Belgium and neither were valid phone numbers. On that final day, she put up a do not disturb sign. This sign was still there when it was time to check out, and that was when staff decided to check on her. Security eventually knocked on her door, and just as they did so, a gunshot rang out. Alarmed, they immediately called the police. They were understandably concerned for their own safety, and so they left the area. Therefore, nobody saw who entered or exited the room. In the meantime, a businessman from across the hall was supposed to be in Belgium and had checked out two days after our dough. He made a very suspicious statement to the staff there. He made a comment about being sorry that she had passed away, except for at that time nobody had found her body yet. He's only referred to in documents as Mr. F. The police tried to locate him, but he disappeared and he's never been found. The room itself was unsecured from the time of the shot until the police arrived. The Oslo police wouldn't arrive for nearly an hour after the shot rang out, in fact. When they entered the room, she was lying on a bed, covered in blood, with a gunshot wound to her head. Police noticed it was a Browning 9mm pistol. The gun itself was considered to be of consequence. Norwegian criminals tended to use Browning 9mm pistols for some reason. In addition, the ID number on the gun had been dissolved with acid. Therefore, the gun couldn't be traced back to anyone. This wasn't the only strange thing, however. She was found holding the gun upside down when fired. There was also zero gunshot residue present on her hand. The door had been locked from the inside, but it was set up in a way it could be locked as someone left. It would also be determined that shot that was heard was a test shot into a pillow. She was actually killed with the second shot that nobody reported hearing. It was considered strange that nobody investigated anything about this case. They just decided it was in fact a suicide. I'm not sure if it's possible to shoot yourself without any gunshot residue, but that's actually a good question if anybody knows anything about this. If you have any knowledge of gunshot residue, I would love it if you would leave it in the comments below. It was also reported that the second key to the room was located inside. It was believed to belong to the second occupant named Lois who was never seen. The man she was seen with across the hall has never been identified, and if he was the same man who said that he heard she had died, that man was also Belgian, but there's no indication they are the same person. When our Jane Doe checked in, she claimed she was 21. Her autopsy, however, said that she was around 25 to 35. All of the labels from her clothes had been removed, so it's impossible to tell what country any of them came from. She had short black hair, but it appeared it might have been dyed. She had gold and porcelain dental work. The police did decide to check where she lived, but the street she gave in Belgium doesn't even exist. She gave an employer, but he doesn't exist either. A plastic newspaper bag was in her room, having an edition of the USA Today newspaper. However, it was addressed to room 2816, which was located on the opposite end of the hallway. If they knew who was staying in that room at that time, they didn't say. When they examined her briefcase, it contained 25 bullets and the gun used in her death. Also, housekeepers had noticed her room had a single duvet on the bed. Yet, at the time of her death, there were two duvets on the bed. The investigators didn't bother to search for any hairs or fluids, and the bedding was entirely disposed of the next day. She had dinner delivered to her room the night before, and she was found to have eaten shortly before she died, but that means she would have refrained from eating until the next morning. 
I have no idea why the police suddenly decided to look at it much later, but when they went back, they discovered the records were destroyed in 2010. The authorities believe she could be European and was around 24 years old at the time of death, meaning she was born around 1971. She has gone unidentified for 26 years. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. Take care of yourselves and each other.